Welcome to this exciting new series on Ecosystem TV, uh, where we talk to some very prolific leaders from um, Asia Pacific, titled The Leadership Dialogue on the Asian Sentiment for 2023. We're going to talk about the macroeconomic trends, the key drivers, the role that technology is going to play in shaping 2023 and beyond for us. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Ahmed Mazari, the president for Microsoft Asia, Padmashri Paddy Ayer, uh, global people and talent leader, and of course, uh, Luca DeStefanis, the CMO for Kindrel Asia Pacific. So welcome to this, uh, to this session and thank you for joining us. So, you know, we, we, I wanted to kick off with the macroeconomic trends, the, um, the role that the Asian economies are gonna play in 2023. Now we know that even before the crisis that we've been in for the past three years, the Asian economies have uh, sustained some exceptional growth. And despite you know, the rough weather we've had in 2022, the forecast for 2023, the outlook is still very strong for some of these economies. And by 2030, we expect that at least seven of the top 10 economies around the world are gonna be based here in Asia. And collectively, they're gonna account for about 47% of the global GDP. And the question that one has to ask is, how much of that focus is actually shifting to Asia from large corporates from around the world? And so, Ahmed, you know, you obviously lead uh, one of the largest uh, corporates that I can think of. You play a big role in shaping the digital economy. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on your outlook for 2023 and what we could expect. Asia is meant to grow at least 170, 180 bips higher in terms of economic growth compared to the rest of the world. So we estimate Asia to be in the 4.7% range with economies like India growing north of 6%. In fact, I was in India last week. India grew at 6.5%. Indonesia is going to grow in the 5 plus percent range. So it'll Vietnam. We'll see some compression in Australia and New Zealand for sure, which probably mimics a little bit the more Western markets. But just there continues to be uh, you know, optimism. There continues to be opportunity. And I think as, as tech leaders, we have a huge role to play in the enablement of economic progress and societal inclusion. Um, Luca, I'm, I'm gonna take this one, this next one to you. Um, and I'll come to you soon, Paddy, because there is a question that I have for you that'll lead in from here, hopefully with what Luca's gonna talk about. Um, are you seeing enough large corporates putting that emphasis on Asia? And, and do you see that as um, being something that should be a priority? Investment uh, in, in Asia is, uh, is key. It's uh, key for large co corporation from around the world. Um, I don't have, like uh, Hamid, any crystal ball for 2023, uh, but I have uh, a, a very clear view on what are the key trends that are impacting uh, our region uh, from now till, uh, let's say, 2030. And as you said, uh, Asia is supposed to, to represent uh, to, to, to have seven out of 10 countries uh, by largest GDP. Uh, India is gonna be number three. Vietnam is uh, projected to grow from number 41 to, to number eight. Uh, so there are a lot of elements like uh, the increasing relevance uh, in the global scene of the ecosystem of startups in the region, um, accelerated growth in terms of investment on new technology that are driving the, the growth and they are very strong signal for a uh, positive signal for the regions. You know, a key priority for organizations at the moment is um, finding the right access to talent, but also managing their costs around not just attracting, but retaining talent. So what do you reckon will be the outlook for uh, tech talent in 2023? One is to acknowledge that e there is indeed a talent scarcity because we've so the meta picture is we've moved from a talent abundance position to a state of talent shortage. This is not simply to be attributed to COVID, but that is the sort of situation that we are on. PwC suggests that you know over 50% of CEOs are suggesting we don't have the right talent for the, for the, with digital skills. The accessibility to the talent uh, has become easier, one, virtually uh, being, uh, you know, accessing through interviews, but virtual jobs to follow. And although, be it, we're seeing a lot of talent uh, being laid off, 
in the in, in the talent function, I can tell you how much we're talking about. Give me those lists, you know. Where is that talent? So it's really about recasting the talent. So digital is big, the digital talent is big, and it's here to stay. So that's that's where our head is at. Emma, I know that talent is a topic very close to your heart as well. The core issue for organizations will remain around finding the people who have the learning mindset, who have the growth mindset, who can they can then skill and reskill into areas where it becomes meaningful and progressive. I think the second aspect, you know, any societal progress, economic progress, inclusive progress will probably be limited by what is the capacity that's available to within the organization within the community, within the country to drive progress. You know, if you look at markets like Australia and Singapore, for example, there are companies that are trying to encourage the workforce to come back into the office. Mm -hmm. So if one, we have what we call a productivity paranoia. Uh, and the par productivity paranoia stroke paradox is that uh, employees believe that they are significantly more productive mm. in offline than their managers believe. Right, so 73% employees believe that they're more productive being themselves and kind of working offline or in hybrid modes. And equally, but I think about 70% of employer, em, ma, employee managers are not sure about productivity, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we call the paradox, paranoia store paradox. The second is, uh, employees are saying, look, we're not going to come back because of a law or a diktat. We're going to come back because we want to come back for the collaboration, for the friendships, for the co-working, for the innovation, for the culture, right? So you can drive mandates. It'll probably push people in one, you'll polarize people more. And therefore, as a company, we offer huge flexibility, right? You, we have a flexibility. We have a work-life policy. We have a hybrid policy. You sign up to it, and, and we're very flexible. So we, we haven't kind of gone in, in one polarized direction or the other. I think the third thing is, which is probably what you hinted at, Paddy, is you have to re-recruit every day. I mean, I mean, literally, you have to re-recruit your employees every day because employees, you know, from the days that I started working, which is many years ago to today, People are look. People want to join companies that have purpose. People want to join companies where they are challenged. People want to join and stay with companies where they get energized to work every day and contribute and do meaningful work: sustainability, inclusion, uh, you know, working on pro programs and projects that help cre basically create better progress. Uh, but Patty, you would have dealt with some of this, um, some of these, um, the paranoia that Emma referred to not just over the last three years, but where the world's going now. I mean, not just in terms of retaining the talent, but attracting talent. I mean, what's your view on that? I mean, what do you see from a cultural standpoint for organizations? Uh, how do they deal with the hybrid work um, in the next couple of years? I think inherently, the, the sort of ask that employees have from the, from the employers is changing. Yeah. So there are the, the hygiene factors um, it, it, today are pretty much stars, you know, staring at flexibility of work, as you suggested. Um, also in terms of, um, you know, what is the sort of, um, you know, you know, there are some which are being looked at as table stakes. So what sort of, um, do I get to work from home? Do I have the flexibility? What sort of work environment that I have in the office? These have become uh, table stakes. But over and above, as you said, uh, there is, an there is an inherent ask of employees to say, I want to be part of organizations where there is progress going on. I want to be part of organizations where I'm hearing that, uh, that the leaders are interested in the sustainability agenda. They are interested in diversity. Uh, if I have a problem, I know that the organization is going to care for me, and that's not going to be defined by simply policies, but the leadership posturing uh, far and further into the organization that they can trust in that. And so these are starting to become uh, the new set of non-negotiables for people why they want to stay in organizations. So you just, uh, interestingly, interestingly, you just spoke about a little while back, not just about attracting, but what's going to get them to stay. Because very quickly, people are going to readjust their priorities in organizations, which can lead the way with this. So organizations that are not paying attention to this and just sort of, uh, staying with the, the, the erstwhile norms are really going to lose out in this war for talent. So, Luca, you've obviously uh, seen a lot of this be enabled for organizations as well. 
Um, as an organization, I know that Kindrel itself uh, follows a fairly similar policy as Emma described. Yeah. Uh, what's your perspective on what this would look like um, from a hybrid work perspective? Yeah, look, first, uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid work is, gonna, is there to stay. Uh, I, I think there is not option. 60% uh, of the companies in the region, they have a very clear uh, hybrid workplace uh, plans. Um, we, we are seeing in the region CIOs prioritizing fully digital experience. Uh, the number of CIO working on this was 5% three years ago. It's now 25%. So um, it's, uh, it's significant. It's technology enab enabled. And um, last year in 2021, a Singapore line embarked in a very major uh, workplace transformation project uh, that ultimately resulted in uh, very personalized uh, employee experience based on the job role, yeah. very consistent uh, support across the world, regardless of the location, uh, and of course with the ability and solutions that are, uh, with the ability to scale uh, with uh, cloud, uh, cloud-based solution and with a streamlined supply chain on vendors that is uh, consistently managed. Uh, to, to a midpoint, uh, you mentioned before uh, the growth mindset of, uh, of employees and, and the need to recruit people with growth mindset. I think we need the leaders also with growth mindset and the ability to, to manage uh, the hybrid workplace. I think we, companies really need to move from uh, push to pull, not pushing people back to office, and not even pulling people with uh, freebies. I'm hearing about uh, free breakfast, uh, free lunch, uh, free, mm, free happy hours, uh, which uh, can be nice to socially bond uh, with colleagues. But I think more and, pro more and more employees will look for meaningful, relevant moment. I go back to office because there is a meaningful, relevant moment that is uh, uh, enabling my personal growth because I meet very interesting people, because we have a very interesting discussion around uh, some key topics. Uh, because we invite people from outside to enrich this conversation. So leaders will need to create more and more meaningful moments, pulling people back to office and, uh, and creating value for the employees. That's where I think, uh, what I think needs to happen, and that's a cultural shift that ne really needs to happen. Wonderful. I, um, I think what I captured from what three of you shared was uh, two Ps that come out of this. The first one, of course, is purpose mm -hmm. is going to drive the mindset, um, and it's going to be all about people. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I want to thank you, uh, all three of you, for, for this segment. In the next segment, we will cover um, te themes around technology disruption and the impact that that's going to create across these economies uh, in the next coming years.